so we are doing this virtually, everybody. I am Megan. If you hear the dogs wrestling in the background, that's because the dogs always like to wrestle as soon as I get into a meeting. I am here today with Eric and partner with Conduction Technology. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having us. Oh, it is my pleasure. So while I have really enjoyed being able to work with you guys in person too, because they sometimes are able to come down to Florida, uh, they are based up in Huntsville, Alabama, and Conduction Technologies works on a lot of different projects, everything from dog toys like Swift Paws to spacecraft. So Eric, I think you'd be the single best person to explain a little bit about what Conduction is and how you support your customers. We are a group of engineers. Our goal is to be experts at a lot of what's in embedded systems and the mechanical systems around it. So our goal is to know the software, know the firmware, help customers solve their problems using the latest technologies, everywhere from a dog toy up to a spacecraft. So we're excited about it and, uh, and to support our customers to be successful. We are talking about Chase. And for everybody who's already jumped on board oh. and has pre-ordered Chase, we're involving them in the process. And I think it's super cool to let our customers help guide the development as well. One of the big challenges that uh, we worked together on to overcome was how we were going to go from Home Original, which you can actually see on the table there, to Home Plus. That was back in 2021. We had to go from something that could do a certain level and beef it up a little bit. And now we're doing the reverse. So you want to tell us a little bit about how we're going to get there? Certainly. So Home Original and Home Plus, they are amazing products. We're out, we were able to use a lot of the same parts between those products. At the time, they weren't intended to be a very high volume solution because every company grows and we knew where we were at. But now that Chase is out, we see that this is going to serve a lot more people. And some of the bells and whistles of Home Original and Home Plus are probably too much. So when we've started from a clean sheet of paper, we've used the lesson learned, the supply chain, the knowledge of Home Original and Home Plus to go back to the drawing boards and redesign Swift Paws for this 100 foot, 20 mile an hour application. So with that, a lot of stuff is different. So one of the major requirements is this needs to be more affordable. But one thing that Swift Paws always has been and always wants to continue to be, and I know you guys support us on that, is we try to keep the quality, the safety as high as we possibly can. We want these products to have a 10 year plus lifespan, right? That doesn't mean stuff that you have to replace over time. Like if you have a car, it needs an oil change, it's gonna need new tires, but the car itself should last you a long time. And we don't want to compromise on that, even when we're making a more affordable product. And that said, too, we also want to try to do as much of it as we can in our backyard, meaning doing it here, uh, either in my hometown or even like the PCBs are made up by you guys in Huntsville. And so that is a really important piece of the puzzle for me, too. So talking about trying to get this product, Chase, to do 100 feet long, 20 miles an hour, and the motor requirement, and we're still not 100% there, right? We're still in the process of figuring out exactly the specs we need. How are you guys determining that? So as we work with our manufacturers, we're looking for a few key pieces of information. Mm -hmm. And to get there, what we're doing is we're doing some laboratory experiments to answer the questions of the supply chain. And that's resolving down to what we think is a great production configuration from a supply chain perspective, from a manufacturing assembly perspective, and then also something that looks and feels like the Swift Paws brand. Awesome, guys. So I see some stuff on the table there. What have we, Parker, do you want to break it down for me? What are we looking at? This is our motor. We're looking at doing just like a directly driven setup here with the string, just mounted on something I came up with to, to hold the motor all together while we're doing our testing. Back here, we're measuring our current and our voltage and our control signal. So we just want to take, you know, we'll set up something in the office to simulate the course. And we want to see when we're running that motor at the load speed we're advertising. We want to make sure that we're, you know, we're pulling the right electrical power and that we're also doing it, you know, at a safe temperature. That's our sort of main thing here is we'll look at, look at catalogs, we'll see, We'll see sort of what the specifications are on the motor. And if we think that'll work, test one out and we'll just see, can it actually drive the course at the power level we're expecting? But Eric has just uncovered a home original. And so you're looking at the size 550 brush motor. It's a very common motor. It's used in a lot of applications, everything from kitchen gadgets like blenders, all the way to like children's drive on cars. So brushless motors are typically more expensive than brushed, correct? Correct. 
and we're trying to make a more affordable product. So why are we considering, like, what is the advantage of brushless that, that we, is making us sort of consider this jump? Certainly. So there, there's a lot of topics here. The main things here is not just how much is this component, but how much does everything cost by the time it gets to the customer? So that's how big is the box it's in? How big is the plastics that are in the box? How big are does the inside of the product need to be because of the placement of components? So as you see on the home original configuration, the motor drives a pulley that drives a belt that drives the, the drive pulley that the user interacts with. So this has a lot of parts. There's a lot of things that, that require assembly steps and drives up costs, but it also requires a bigger enclosure to accommodate that. When we're doing our chase assessment, we determine that we're able to do a direct drive. We're able to keep the height of the motor shallower, smaller. As you can see, it's approximately one quarter the size. Yeah. And that real, oops, I'm sorry, let me pitch that down. The, that allows us a, a large volume difference, which means a smaller plastic housing and smaller everything around it, which ultimately means that the box that we send out will be smaller and that represents a lower a cost to build this product. That is really cool. I, um, I wasn't sure that brushless would be something that we could even consider affording, but when we started to sit down and talk about it and you're saying things like, yeah, but then the housing doesn't have to be as big and we can do a direct drive, meaning we don't have all those additional components, the belt, the smaller drive wheel that's on the motor powering the larger drive wheel. You're actually reducing costs in other areas and you're able to afford a higher quality motor. Um, it's almost like, like putting that budget where it counts. So I see the test configuration set up. Is it running? Can we see it? This is running. So, so what we have here, this is for, like we said, to 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 learn more about the motors and to pass good requirements to the manufacturer, sorry, the motor manufacturers and, and vendors. So what we have here is, is stuff from a hobby shop that represents about what we think will work for Chase. And we're taking precision measurements so that we can provide very detailed requests to the other engineers with the various motor manufacturers we're working with. So we have the motor, we have the motor controller, we have power supplies, and we have a simple microprocessor that lets us turn the knob and change the speed. Unlike Chase, this only goes one direction because some of these parts were designed for an airplane propeller, a remote control airplane propeller, which only spins one direction. So uh, back here, we're monitoring, like Parker said, the voltage and current and the control signal. So if you can see that, you're gonna see a blue line that's the voltage. It won't change much because we're on a fixed voltage power supply. And the pink line down below is going to be the current, and it's going to change depending on its starting and, and the various loads in the system. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and reset the screen so you see the current goes away. Oh, yeah. Okay. I see it. And Parker, would you show us what it looks like to run Chase? All right. Just turning this knob here and get it going. Oh, yeah. I can see it going. All right. So what we see here? Yeah, that line looks a lot wider now. So we see a starting spike. That spike is really the system building up not only the inductive energy in the coils, but also putting the momentum into the string. Once it's up and running, it kind of steadies out. Now, when somebody uses Swift Pause, they probably aren't just going to let it run continuously. They're probably going to go back and forth. Our controller can't do that, but we have enough information from what you see on the screen here in order to, to have the technical conversation we need to pick the perfect motor. That is so cool. So I see the motor itself spinning. Tell me a little bit about that. Because the motor, the motor that I'm looking at on the original one, the outside of that motor doesn't spin. Correct. So this is what's called an outrunner motor. So that means that there's a column, uh, really a tube that's fixture to the base here. On the outside of that tube are the magnetic coils that are hooked up to the, the power supplies. And a bearing assembly is down the core. There's a shaft coming through it. That's what the pulley is mounted to. That shaft goes all the way to the top. And that's where the, the rotating assembly on the top goes. That rotating assembly has the, the permanent magnets. And those coils are pushing the permanent magnets around in a circle. Because of this design, because of a, the way an outrunner motor works, it allows it to be smaller. So it doesn't require the brushes and it has a lot more power per unit mass. That's a few of the reasons why you see such a difference between these two motors. 
we are we are evaluating non outrunner motors but we really think that this is this is getting close to what we'll end up with in the real product based on all of our testing we tested i think about eight different motors at this point mm -hmm. that really envelope all of the possible things that we that are we're taking seriously for chase that is that is amazing and i cannot wait we'll get you guys down here when we actually have like our first full prototype set up to play with in the park. And you'll have to bring our chief test pilot, Maverick, with you when you come down. So Maverick is Eric's dog, and he proudly likes to take test flights on, on the early prototype. He loves it and takes a lot of discipline to to let go when it's time to let go of the swift pause, but he he has too much anticipation. He really wants to play. He was testing with us on Friday when we were doing some testing, and, <laughs> and I know that our next step really is to bring the system outside and to yeah. put it in the real world. So we're really excited about that, and you know Maverick will be part of it. Oh, yeah, he will love that. And, and one of the things that is a huge difference between playing on a desk and playing outside in the grass, and this is where – you think, okay, it's really simple. It's a motor, it's turning some string. How hard can it be? But there are so many variables when you go outside. There's weather, there's temperature, there's the surface you're running on, there's drag, there's how tall is the grass. So talk to me a little bit about, I, I know we've been through it. We, we went through this ad nauseum with plus because we were trying to make a higher power, higher torque motor drive system. So heat is a huge issue or can be a huge issue how are we addressing heat and how are you making sure that this is safe to use and isn't going to overheat under normal use certainly so this system is smaller but when it's smaller it requires less power because the course is shorter that what that meant is that though our, our thermal requirements going down because of the performance of the system our ability to cool off also went down. So the problem is just as real as it is when it's a bigger system. So we take that very seriously. We see as an example of a, or this is a, a, a thermal camera that's oh, looking cool. at the outrunner motor. We can use it to look down into the coils and we're looking to make sure that the system always stays at a safe operating temperature under all the scenarios. And when we talk about safety, those are some of the biggest safety features that our home lure crossing kits have. It's, stopping it when a dog steps on the line so they don't get line burn and stopping the motor before it overheats so that it doesn't damage the equipment. So these types of parameters, once we identify the motor, once we get a full test set up, then we can start to really put it into use and determine what these parameters for safety need to be. And you guys also do all of the software for not only the PCB, but then also when we're developing the app. So Really quick, one thing that we can get, I think that would be really good feedback from everybody who has pre-ordered Chase or is considering and, and wants to uh, look at using Chase is what type of feedback would you think would be really helpful? So right now we let people know, hey, it's stalled or hey, you're, you know, with home original, it runs off the battery. So we'll say, hey, your battery's low. What types of feedback can we come up with, can we think, I mean, maybe even you guys can think of a few examples, but we'll have the ability to put a message on a screen and that's really powerful. Absolutely. And, and because we do this all from scratch, because we have complete control over it, we really can can solve some some um, some more technical things. So if people get creative, if you guys get creative and come up with something, we'll take it as a challenge and, and really consider it. If anybody has thoughts on what type of feedback they'd like to know, I mean, it would be so cool and we would have the ability to tell you how much runtime you've had, right? Like, hey, you just played for this many minutes or there's so many different data points that we could give people. What do you want to know? What type of feedback in the app that you want to know based on your machine? But you guys, this is so cool. And I can't wait to get hands on again with you in person. I am blown away by the difference in size of these two motors and the fact that we're able to sort of pave a new path with Chase. I mean, even though we've done this with Home Original, with Home Plus, and all the way back starting in 2012 with our pro-grade equipment, every single time we put ourselves to the task of creating a new product, it's almost like reinventing the wheel, kind of pun intended. <laughs> It, it really is cool to see the generations of ideas within Swift Paws, and and it's a reminder to not get stuck, right? Go back to that drawing board every now and then and make sure uh, what you're bringing is the latest, greatest. So we're really excited about Chase hitting the market this year. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you for being a part of the team that's helping to bring it to life, and can't wait to get with you guys out in the field and start testing it. Thank you very much, Megan. <laughs> yeah, take care.